Hello everyone, welcome to this second module for evaluating the acceptability thresholds of quality traits for roots, tubers and bananas. This module deals with the choice of sensory attributes and sampling. It was produced by Zoé de Cher and revised by Christophe Bugot and Adam C. Laurent. We will start this module by dealing with the various issues surrounding sampling starting with a few reminders, followed by the number of samples to choose, the contrast between sample, sample nomination, and the experimental design to be used in the consumer test. This plan will depend on the number of samples selected. And finally, I will talk about the order in which the samples are presented to the consumers. To begin this section on samplings, it's important to recall a few general points. First of all, it's essential to use the same raw materials for all analyses, in other words, the hedonic analyses, which is the consumer test, but also the quantitative descriptive analyses and the instrumental analyses. These analyses must therefore be carried out at the same time. In practice, if the raw material keeps well and does not change over time, it's possible to carry out these analyses over a few days. Otherwise, it's necessary to carry out all the analyses on the same day. Then, before starting your various analyses, it's important to calculate precisely how much raw material will be needed to perform all the analyses. If you don't have much raw material, you may have to adapt your analyses accordingly. Finally, when you carry out consumer tests and QDA analyses, it's important that all the samples tested come from the same production batch. For example, if you are analyzing a processed and cooked food, such as atike, your consumer test and QDA analysis must be based on the same atike processed in the same place and at the same time. The second point to address is the number of samples. As I pointed out in the previous module, you need to study at least six samples to be able to draw curves and calculate acceptability thresholds. Here are two ideal and fictitious curves that can be obtained from six points. On the left-hand curve, for firmness, there is a bell-shaped curve. This curve makes it easy to see that when the product is too firm or not firm enough, the majority of consumers do not appreciate the product. On the graph to the right, for the sweetness attribute, we can see a straight line that illustrates the fact that the sweeter the product, the more consumers like it. These two examples are ideal, and that's what we are trying to get as close to as possible. In this slide, I'm going to illustrate that it can be important to choose more than six samples to make sure you don't make any mistakes when interpreting the results. In this ideal example, I showed you in the previous slide, the six samples produced nice curves for calculating the thresholds. In the top left-hand corner here, you can see the curve I presented earlier for firmness. The six points produce a bell-shaped curve and show, in green, that for more than 60% of the population to be satisfied, the firmness has to be between around 3.5 and 6.2. Now let's imagine that when it came to choosing the samples to study, we hadn't chosen the six shown here in blue, but only the four circled in black, and two others chosen at random, which is closer to reality. By choosing these six new samples, which include the four blue ones and the two new one in pink, we obtain a curve that is no, is no longer bell-shaped, but, but straight. If we interpret this curve, we could say that the firmer the product, the more consumers appreciate it. If we take the six initial samples in blue, the two pink ones and a new one in black, for a total of nine samples, we find the shape of the bell curve and the correct interpretation of the thresholds for firmness. Of course, what I've just shown and explained is only a fictitious example, but it simply serves to illustrate the fact that the more samples you choose, 
the greater the chance that they will be different and will enable you to obtain a curve that represents the reality of preference and therefore of correct thresholds. After choosing the number of samples to study, the second important point is to choose samples that are contrasting for all the sensory attributes you want to study. I'm going to give you another fictitious example. You decide to work with nine different samples and to study five sensory attributes, firmness, bitterness, stickiness, sweetness, and milliness. Once you've carried out the QDA analysis and the consumer test with the nine samples and five sensory attributes, you can obtain different results and therefore different type of curves depending on the sensory attributes. I'm going to show you a few examples of curves you may be able to obtain. The first example is firmness, our ideal situation. The nine samples are well contrasted, giving a nice bell-shaped curve, and it's easy to determine the threshold of acceptability. The second sensory attribute study here is bitterness. For these attributes, we can see that the points representing the samples are close to each other. This means, on the one hand, that there is little contrast between the samples, since their bitterness intensity perceived in quantitative sensory analysis is between 2 and 4. On the other hand, we can see that for all the samples with similar bitterness intensity, there is consistency among consumers, since for all the samples, between 20 and 30% of consumers appreciate the intensity. To increase the chances of obtaining usable results, you can add new samples to the analysis whose bitterness intensity you know to provide contrast, or replace some of your samples with more contrasting ones. For the sweetness attribute, we can see that the samples are grouped into two groups, one where the sweetness intensity is between 2 and 4 and appreciated by around 40% of consumers, and the other group with a sweetness intensity between 7 and 8, for which 50 to 70% of the population questions is satisfied. In this case, we don't know what will happen between the two groups of samples, do we have a maximum or a continuity? We can imagine that we could draw an increasing straight line, but we are not sure. To be sure, we would need to add new samples that contrast with the two groups observed. The next example is for the milliness attribute. Here we can see that some of the samples are similar because they are grouped together on the graph but that despite that there are still several samples which are quite contrasting and which make it possible to obtain four different points and therefore be able to draw a curve. Here is the last example of possible results. For stickiness, you can see that the points are scattered all over the graph. It's therefore impossible to interpret these results, as there is no correlation between stickiness intensity and consumer appreciation. When this kind of result is obtained, there can be two main reasons. Either there really is no link between stickiness and consumer preference, or the sticky descriptor is poorly understood by consumer and therefore poorly interpreted and rated. There is a lack of consensus. In this case, it may be important to redefine the attributes clearly to ensure that it's well understood by both interviewers and consumers. Despite a clear definition and a good number of contrasting samples, it's still possible to obtain this type of results. This can sometimes be due to the correlation of one descriptor with another. In other words, consumer preferences is not guided by this descriptor. In the different examples I have just shown you, we have seen that even if you have chosen a sufficient number of samples for the study, sometimes they do not allow you to define acceptability thresholds for all the sensory attributes chosen. Depending on the different cases, I have suggested a solution to put in place to avoid this happening, such as adding extra samples or modifying them. In order to know which samples you can select for analysis, you can refer to results acquired previously during the RTB food 
project, for example, which enable you to identify contrasting varieties. This will ensure you to have a sufficient number of contrasting samples for each sensory attributes. Point number four concerns the coding of samples. Once you have chosen the samples you wish to study, you will need to rename them for the QDA and consumer tests. The samples must all be named using a random three-letter code. For the same sample, the code must be the same for the QDA analysis and the consumer tests. In this table, you have an example of six samples, initially num numbered from one to six, each of which has been assigned a three-letter code. We will now move on to the experimental design part. The experimental plan needs to be set up and adapted on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the number of samples chosen. However, whatever the number of samples you wish to analyze, you absolutely must interview a minimum of 100 consumers per sample, uh, so 125 would be better. Bearing in mind that a consumer cannot taste more than six different samples in one session. I'm going to start developing this part of the experimental design with the easiest situation, which is when you want to analyze six different samples and they are all available on the same day. When you are studying six different samples, you will need to interview 100 to 125 consumers in total. Each consumer will test all the six products in different order, but in the end you will have 100 to 125 consumers per sample. In parallel with the consumer tests, you will need to carry out QDA and instrumental analysis. Depending on the type of product you are studying, you will need to carry out this analysis on the same day as the consumer test or in the days that follow. Please note that the six sample experimental design is the simplest, but by no means the most optimal, because as I showed you earlier, having only six samples is often not enough to calculate thresholds of acceptability. I'm now going to present you with the second possible case, which is when you have fewer than six samples available at the same time for analysis. If this is the case, you will have to carry out the various analyses, the consumer test, the QDA analysis, and the instrumental analysis several times until you reach a minimum of six samples analyzed in total. Here is an example of a situation where you don't have six samples available at the same time. In this example, you would like to study eight banana varieties, three of which could be harvested in December and the next five in January. In this situation, you need to carry out an initial series of analyses on the three samples of December. So, you do the consumer test with 100 to 125 consumers, where each consumer tests each, each of the three samples. You do a QDA analysis in the laboratory with a trained panel, and you do the instrumental analysis in parallel. In January, you harvest the remaining five varieties. You carry out the same analysis as in December, but on these five varieties under the same conditions as before. The consumer test is to be carried out at, in the same place as before, still with 100 to 125 consumers, but they will be different from those in December. You will repeat the QDA analysis under the same condition and with the same parallel as in December and repeat the same instrumental analysis. The approach is therefore the same at each time you analyze new samples. The consumer test is the same, even if the consumers are different. The QDA analysis will be the same, but for the QDA, it's very important to have the same panel members on the jury. And finally, the instrumental analysis will also be the same. When you have less than six samples available at the same time, you need to repeat the analysis as many times as necessary until you have results for six or more samples, 
in order to calculate the thresholds. The only constraint will, with this method is time, as repeating the different analysis several times can be very time consuming. Lastly, as in this situation we don't exceed six samples in the consumer test, all consumers can test all products, so there is no particular experimental design to build, just remember to present the samples in, dif in a different order to the consumers. Now we come to the third possible situation where you want to analyze more than six samples at the same time. This choice is the one that will give you the best chance of obtaining reliable results and determining acceptability thresholds. As a consumer cannot taste more than six products in a consumer test, in this study situation, not all consumers will be able to taste all the products. However, each product must be tasted by at least 100 consumers. In this case, we will need to set up a precise and specific experience plan. In sensory evaluation, this experience plan is called an incomplete balanced experience plan. Balance means that each product is tasted by an identical number of consumers. Incomplete means that not all consumers taste every product. To help you understand what a balanced incomplete experience plan is, I'm going to show you an example. I've chosen to use an example with five samples because it's easier to explain and understand but I would like to remind you that this type of experience plan should only be used when you have more than six samples. In our example, we want to analyze five samples coded here from one to five. I would also like to remind you that when you carry out your studies, your samples should have a three letter code and not a number as in this simplified example. In our example, we decide that we have five samples and that each consumer will only taste three samples. We then look for all possible combination of three samples out of the five. As you can see here, there are 10 possible combination of three samples out of five. For five samples, we have 10 possible combinations of three samples. In our example, it's easy to count them, but as the number of samples increases, it becomes much more difficult. To make the job easier, there is a formula that calculates the number of possible combinations directly. To fully understand the formula, you will need a quick mathematical refresher first. I'm going to explain the notion of factorial. In mathematics, the factorial of a natural number n is the product of the strictly positive integers less than or equal to n. For example, the factorial of 5 is equal to 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. The factorial is marked with an exclamation mark and is read as factorial of n. After this little mathematical reminder, we can move on to the formula I was telling you about. The number of possible combination is equal to the factorial of the total number of samples noted in blue divided by the factorial of the total number of samples in blue minus the number of samples tested per consumer in the range multiplied by the factorial of the number of samples tested per consumer. Now that we have the formula, we can apply it to the example we saw before to see if we find the same number of combination as we counted. Here we have five samples in total. And each consumer tastes three samples. The number of combination is therefore equal to the factorial of five divided by the factorial of five minus three multiplied by the factorial of 3. By doing this calculation, we found the results of 10 combination, which is the same results as the one we found previously. Now that we know the number of possible combinations, we would like to know how many times each sample is present in these different combinations. 
Here again, when there are a few samples, it's possible to count. Still in our same example of five samples, we can see that each sample is presented six times in the 10 combinations of three samples. For example, if we look at sample, at sample number two in green, we find it in the first three combinations and then in the three near the end. Once again, to save us the trouble of counting, which can be very time consuming when there are a lot of samples, there is a formula. The number of times a sample appears in the different combinations is equal to the factorial of the total number of samples minus one divided by the factorial of the total number of samples minus the number of samples tested per consumer multiplied by the factorial of the number of samples tested per consumer minus one. In our example, the calculation of the number of time samples appear in combination is equal to the factorial of five minus one divided by the factorial of five minus three multiplied by the factorial of three minus one. The results of this calculation, which you can see here at the end, is equal to six, just as we counted manually above. We now know that with five samples, if each consumer tastes three, there are 10 possible combinations of three samples. Of these 10 possible combinations, each sample is present six times. So if we have 10 consumers, each sample will be tasted six times. Now we would like to know how many consumers we need to question so that each sample is tasted at least 100 times. To answer this question, we simply need to do a product of crosses. We know that with 10 combinations, the product appears six times. So how many consumers are needed for it to appear a hundred times? The calculation of the total number of consumers to be questioned for each sample to be tested 100 times is as follows. 100 multiplied by the number of combination and divided by the number of times a sample appears in the different combination. In our example, if we calculate 10 times 100 divided by 6, the total of consumers to, to be interviewed is 166.7. As the result is a number of consumers, we cannot have a decimal point so we always have to round up. In our case, we will need to question 167 consumers. Here is a summary of the various calculations I've just given you. At the start, you decide how many samples you want to study and how many samples each consumer will test. Once you've determined these numbers of samples, you can calculate the number of possible combinations, then the number of times each sample appears in these different combinations, and finally, the total number of consumers to question so that each sample has been tested at least 100 times. If you wish, you can also choose to have each sample tested at least 125 times and redo the calculations using 125 instead of 100. I would remind you that if you only have six samples or less to analyze at one time, it's not necessary to apply this approach because all of the consumers will be able to taste all the products. To save you having to do all the calculation, here is a table showing a number of possible conditions you can use. For example, if you decide to analyze nine samples and have each consumer test four, you will have 126 possible combinations of four samples out of the nine selected. Of these 126 combinations, each sample will be present 56 times. You will need to interview 225 consumers so that each sample has been tested a total of 100 times. If the experimental design you wish to use is not shown in this table, you can perform 
the calculations as I explained above, or come back to us for help in setting up the experimental design. Now that you know the number of consumers you need to have at least 100 responses per sample, you need to know which sample you are going to present to the consumers and in which order. This is the subject of the part six. The number and order of samples will of course depend on the experimental design you have chosen to implement. If you have six samples or less in your consumer test, you will have a fully balanced design, which means that each judge will evaluate all the samples and all the samples will be tested the same number of times. On the other hand, if you have more than six samples to analyze in your consumer test, you will use an incomplete balanced plan where each judge will evaluate only part of the samples, but all the samples will be tasted by the same number of consumers, plus or minus one. Luckily, there, is, there are no mathematic formula this time as Excel stat allows you to calculate the different plans. If you don't have Excel stat to do it, don't hesitate to contact us so we can calculate it for you. I'm now going to explain you how to obtain these plans from Excel stats. Once you have opened Excel stats, you must first click on the big green plus, then on sensory data analysis, and finally on DOE for sensory data analysis. This window will then open. Here, I'm going to show you an example of a complete balanced plan with six samples and where each consumer tests the six products. In the window that opens, in the product box, you must indicate the number of samples you have. In this example, it's six. In the product's accessories box, you must indicate the number of samples to be tested by each consumer. In our case, six samples per consumers. In the Accessors box, you need to enter the number of consumers you're going to interview in total. In our case, it's 125. Then, tick session one, and when you have finished, click on OK. A new tab entitled Sensory Design will then open in Excel Stat with the various results of your analysis. To get your order of presentation of samples to consumers, and find out which consumers will be testing which product, you need to scroll down the page until you see the results entitled Accessors X Ranks Table. It's the line 179 in my example. In this table, each row corresponds to a consumer and the six columns give the order in which the samples will be tested. For example, the first consumer, G1, will test the samples in this order number one in first, then number three, then number six, then number five, then number two, and to finish number four. It's up to you to decide which sample corresponds to which number. Thanks to this table, you know in which order you should present the six samples to your 125 consumers. We now want to obtain a sample presentation order when we have more than six samples, so we have an incomplete balanced experimental design. The Excel stat procedure will be the same as described above. Let's imagine a new example where you have 10 samples and you want each consumer to taste six samples. Before starting the Excel stat analysis, you need to know how many consumers you want to question as you will need to enter this number in Excel stat. To do this, you can look at the table provided on slide 23. According to this table, an extract of which you can see here, you need to question 167 consumers to obtain at least 100 responses per sample. Now that you know the total number of samples, the number of samples to be tested per consumer and the number of consumers to be surveyed, you can run your analysis on Excel stats.
When you look at the results obtained in the accessors X-Strengths table, you can see that you have 167 rows from D1 to D167 corresponding to the consumers and six columns corresponding to the sample that each consumer must take from the 10. If we take a closer look, we can see that the judges don't have the same samples. For example, consumer number one will access sample number three, then five, then one, then two, then four, and finally number six. Whereas judge number two will first access sample number eight, then number seven, then number 10, then number nine, then two, and number one. If you scroll down a little further in the document, you will find a table entitled Order Effect Table. It's the line 407 in this example. This table shows you the number of times each sample was tested in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth position. In this example, we can see that sample number one was presented 17 times in first position, 16 times in second position, 17 times in third position, 16 times in fourth position, 17 times in fifth position, and 17 times in sixth position. If we add up the number of times a sample was presented, we get 100. We can see that some samples were tested a total of 101 times, while others were tested 100 times. This is due to the fact that our, in our calculation of the total number of consumers to be tested, we rounded up the number of consumers required. This poses no problem at all in the analysis, the main thing being to have a minimum of 100 responses per sample. Once we have looked at, the, at all the sampling conditions, we can move on to the second major point, which is the choice of sensory attributes to be studied in the consumer test and QDA analysis. The choice of sensory descriptors obviously depends on the product you wish to study. You can use the sensory attributes defined in the RTB food product profiles. You must not exceed a total of five sensory attributes. It's important to draw up a clear list of definitions for each sensory attribute selected. It's important that each consumer test investigator, investigator knows these definitions and knows how to explain them to consumer. If certain descriptors are misunderstood by consumers, either because the definition is unclear or because the word used for the descriptor is too complicated, the results may be unusable. It's important to point out that sometimes the same descriptor can have different definitions depending on the country in which it's used. For example, the sensory attribute sweetness may be defined as the amount of sugar in the food for some or as a sensation of sweet for others. It's also possible that certain descriptors are too specific and unfamiliar to consumers. Vitrosity, for example. Care must therefore be taken to choose words that all naive consumers can understand. Finally, some descriptors have definitions that are difficult to explain to consumers, such as milliness. I would like to thank you for listening to this tutorial and wish you all the very best for the festive season. If you have any question or need help setting up your analysis, don't hesitate to contact me at this email address. Thank you so much. See you soon.